buddy. <clears throat> My name is Sarah Wooten. I am wearing a shirt. <laughs> Let's make sure I get that up a little bit. So I am going to wait until people start popping on. But if you're joining me on the replay, welcome. I am Dr. Sarah Wooten and I am a veterinarian. And I have practiced for years and years and years in small animal medicine. And I am here today to answer your questions. So it's going to be great. We're going to love it. I just have to wait until everything coordinates in the internet technology world. So um, while I'm waiting for all you guys to hop on, let me tell you one of my favorite stories. Hi. Hi. I see you guys starting to pop on now. So Hi, welcome. As you guys are popping on, I uh, I can tell you one of my favorite stories. One of my favorite patients ever uh, it was a Scottish Fold cat. His name was Toby, and he lived way back in the 1990s. And he lived actually at the clinic where I uh, volunteered my time so that I could actually get into veterinary school. Oh my gosh, it's even earlier we're talking the early 90s here. I'm totally dating myself, friends. So anyways, one of my favorite patients ever was this Scottish fold cat named Toby. And it was way back in Redding, California. And he was awesome. He was the clinic cat. And he pretty much owned the entire clinic. He just kind of walked around and said hi to everybody. And it was great. And it actually, I didn't have any cats at the time. So he kind of was like my cat. But anyways, Welcome. I am so glad you guys are all hopping on now. My name is Dr. Sarah Wooten and I am a veterinarian. I am licensed to practice in the state of Colorado. I have also been licensed to practice in the state of California. I am also a certified veterinary journalist. Ha <laughs> ha, right? It makes some extra letters after my name, my name CVJ. DVM CVJ. And I am uh, USDA certified for the interstate movement of animals. And I don't know, practiced for 16 years in both California and Colorado. And now I'm here today to talk to you guys. So here is the gist. For the next hour, for the next 58 minutes, I will answer your questions. Anything you ask of me, I will do my best to answer. To ask me questions, you're just gonna pop your questions into the chat window. If you've been to these before, then you know that the chat window gets very crowded very quickly. And so if you do have a question, I do recommend putting it in the chat earlier rather than later because the questions tend to pile up on each other and it's harder for me to get to the ones at the very end, especially if you keep asking these extraordinarily in-depth and brilliant questions because apparently you guys are already pretty well educated. So pop the questions in there and I will do my best to start answering them. Now, another thing, another thing I have to say, two more things, actually, I have two things. One, I am not a certified feline behavior expert. Everything I know about behavior, I learned from vet school, from a behavior classes in vet school, from the behavior rotation at UC Davis, which is where I graduated from. Boom. There's my, my license or my diploma or whatever. And then what I learned on the job, right? Uh, and most of my knowledge regarding feline behavior has to do with the medical aspect of it. So you can ask behavior questions. Some of them I may not know because I'm not a behaviorist doctor, right? So um, I also want to tell you that I did bring my big guns here. I have a dermatology book in case we have any derm questions. I have uh, really gross pictures in here, like stuff like this. What? What? What is this? Phacomycosis, fungal infection of the skin. Fortunately, it's pretty rare. Not, never saw it in 16 years. And I also have this big guy. So if you guys ask me big in-depth questions, <clears throat> I can go to the source and not just rely on everything in here. Another thing, I have to say this. This is my disclaimer, okay? And hi, can you say hi, Anastasia? Hi, Anastasia, thank you so much. I'm starting to take a peek at the... Uh, questions here. Thank you all. all. Uh, Denise, hello from Brazil. Um, obviously, I did say hi, Anastasia. <clears throat> 
Hello, JP. Hello, Jonathan Wheeler. Hello, Nikolai. Uh, I am so glad to see you on here. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, Kat Gale. Hello, Lara. Uh, Lara, Lara. Hello, Leggy. Hello, Yeldu. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, so before I get into your questions, I do have to say that this is not veterinary advice and it should not substitute for the time and attention of your local veterinarian. Yes, I know it can be really hard to get in to see us right now. I apologize on behalf of my profession. I apologize to you, but this is not medical advice and should not be used as a substitution for your veterinarian because A, illegal and B, you need somebody who can actually touch your cat, right? This is for educational purposes only. So having said that, let's get into the questions. All right, this one from Drew Drew. Hi, in your opinion, what is the best pet insurance? Well, that's another thing. Legally, I can't really talk about pet insurance because I'm not an insurance salesman. However, as a veterinarian, I have had good experiences with Trupanion. <clears throat> Uh, Trupanion, I always liked using it. Um, it seemed to have pretty good coverage. Um, it had Trupanion Express, which is wonderful because then the, it wasn't a reimbursement thing. It could just, the money could just go straight to the veterinary hospital. So things could move a lot faster. I also like pumpkin insurance. Um, I actually work with pumpkin insurance, so I'm not going to say too much about them, but check them out. Um, they have an amazing blog uh, and I do a lot of work with them. I've heard good things about Embrace. I've actually worked with Nationwide. I think they do a good job too. So if you guys have any recommendations for each other, you can um, put those in the comment section. Okay. Hello, Jessica Ortiz. Here we go. Shishiforu. Oh my goodness. I have seven cats. One of them is sick with an upper respiratory infection since he is five days old today since he was five days old, I think. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry, my friend. Today he is three years old and still very sick. Besides lysine, is there anything else I can do to help him? Well, uh, yes. So um, make sure that he is negative for leukemia, feline leukemia and feline AIDS, FIV is the official term. And those are done by blood test. If you've already done that, great, because those are very infectious and can be spread around to all the cats. Um, two, lysine is good. Um, the other thing you could try is starting him on a probiotic. So probiotics are what we like to call the good guys, the good bacteria. <clears throat> and they live in our gut. And did you know actually that there is just as many bacterial cells in your body as there are human cells? Same thing for the cat, same thing for the dog. There are a lot of bacteria that live in the cat and on the cat. And sometimes if you have a cat with a deranged immune system, those probiotics or those, those bacteria that are living in them can get a little um, out of balance, I guess is the best way to say it. So if you give a probiotic, um, you can often rebalance and help boost their immune system. Immune, immune system. So that's a second idea. Um, third idea, make sure that he has plenty of um, steam. I'm not sure how he's sick, if it's eyes, his ears, or something else, right? But make sure that you um, humidify the environment because humidifying can help loosen secretions. <clears throat> Make sure you are feeding a high quality food. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and then um, also, if he does ever have any kind of bacterial infections, get those treated right away. Okay. And most of all, if you're not happy with his current health status, you need to take him into a vet and say, here is the deal. I am not happy. We need to help him get healthier. What are the things I can do? Because Again, he could have a problem that I don't even know about, right? So <clears throat> next level. Hello. Hi, how are you? Okay. Okay, behavior question. I'll do my best. Remember, veterinarian, not a behaviorist. Nikolai, my male cat is keeping me up 
at all hours of the night while my female cat sleeps on the same schedule as me. Of course the male cat's being difficult. That's what they do. What causes this and how can I change it? Big question. Lots of things can cause animals or cats specifically to have abnormal sleep patterns. So if he's always been a night owl, and this is not a new thing, some things you can do is increase his play sessions during the day um, so that he's really, really tired at night. So get him moving, right? It could just be that he has too much energy. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, make sure to not get up if he's bothering you, because when you do that and you either give him attention or pets or treats or whatever, you reinforce the behavior. So you don't want to reinforce the behavior. So if he's up at night and he's keeping you up or he wants to get you up and play with him, don't <laughs> ignore him. Um, that will be a good thing because otherwise you're just going to reinforce the behavior and he's going to go, well, that worked. I'm going to try it again. Right. If you have problems or he's loud, right. Get a sound machine, close the door. Don't let him into your sleeping space. Right. <clears throat> Some cats, if they're up at night, um, so cats are crepuscular, right. They only, they like to be active at dusk and dawn. Those are tend to be their high activity times. Sometimes they can get a little, you know, a little off. The other thing you can try doing is back to probiotics again. You can try Calm Probiotic, which is a probiotic that's designed to help cats chill out, right? You could also um, offer him some sort of over-the-counter calming treat uh, before he goes to bed and see if it helps, right? These are all kind of uh, troubleshooting ideas. <clears throat> So I'm thinking things like CBD could really help. Um, Anxetane, Zilkine, Anxetane, Zilkine. I know they're licensed for use in dogs. Check for use in cats. Um, there are also other calming aids that you can um, look into. Lots of them out there. Um, I tend to like the ones with the milk proteins, tryptophan, CBD, those ones tend to be the best. Some people have used valerian in their cats. I'm not a huge fan. I, I'm not sure how valerian affects cats, but some people use it. If this is a new behavior and he previously was sleeping through the night, then maybe there's something medical going on. So it's always good to have him checked out because if you had a cat that previously slept at night and now they're up at night and maybe they're making a racket, and maybe they're older. Well, those cats are often suffering from a condition called hyperthyroidism, which causes elevated levels of the thyroid hormone circulating in the blood. And then the thyroid hormone makes them very active and very vocal and very hungry and very thirsty uh, and just extra. They are extra everything, right? So it could be that. Hopefully those are some things to get you started. Good luck. And let me know if it works. Okay. Here is a question. Hello, Rashad Kalani. I, you have a very awesome name and I really like it a lot. Hello, my three month old kitten just threw up worms for the first time. Oh my God. Oh no. And I think it's roundworms. Ah, it's terrible. It's terrible. I'm not sure what to do. Okay. Well, obviously you need to get your kitten dewormed, mon frere. So um, I am just going to look in here. So a couple options, you can do it the easy way. You can call a vet and say, I just saw worms. I'm pretty freaked out. My kitten is three months old, weighs this much. Is there any way you could just, hopefully you have a relationship with a veterinarian already because oftentimes, oftentimes if they know you already, they will just say, hey, that's fine. Let me call in this prescription for you. And sometimes you don't even need to be seen. Um, you can also call a telemedicine veterinarian, somebody who does it online. They can often um, diagnose and prescribe dewormer over the phone. Okay. So there are a couple of over-the-counter dewormers that are available. 
I'm not recommending that you get them, but I am saying that you might be able to find them. You need to make sure that whatever product you're using is licensed for use in cats. There are a lot of cattle dewormers and dog dewormers. And while they may be okay for cats, they're not licensed for using cats. The concentrations are not appropriate for cats. So you wanna get something that's licensed for use in cats. So you could do, you can also do um, a lot of the heartworm preventions that are out there for use in cats, um, milbamycin, things like that. Those also get hookworms and roundworms and things like that. Also, revolution gets worms and that's a topical. Uh, that gets kind of everything as well. Also fleas and ticks. So, something that contains praziquantel, praziquantel, P-R-A-Z-I-Q-U-A-N-T-E-L, might be available over the counter for a dewormer. That will work as well. Um, also, pyrantal pamawait, uh, the trade name is Strongid. Those are also dewormers that are great for hookworms and roundworms. But it could be something like a tapeworm. And if that's the case, that does require a little bit different medication than a hookworm and a roundworm. So let me give you the gold standard first. <laughs> Get a poop sample, take it to your vet. Maybe you don't even have to take the cat, maybe you do, not sure what they do in your area. Have them run the poop sample, look for parasite eggs, treat appropriately for what they see. If they, even if they don't see anything, they'll probably still give you a broad spectrum dewormer. Uh, less gold standard, <clears throat> go to a feed store, find one of those dewormers I was talking about, only for use in cats. This is not medical advice, this is just for education. And see if it works, okay? The good news is, um, generally speaking, worms are not life-threatening. They're just really gross and scary, and they are easy, easy, easy to get rid of, okay? Um, bad news is that some of the parasites that our pets carry uh, are actually transmissible to humans. So if your cat's been defecating in your yard, you're going to want to make sure to pick up all the poop, and you are going to want to um, disinfect the yard, okay? So bleach is your friend. Yeah. And it is transmissible to other pe um, pets as well. Okay, here's a great question. Christian, Batista, my cat just had a bird for breakfast. Thoughts? <laughs> sure, I have thoughts. <laughs> um, well, Cats have been eating birds for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years without any problems. So could be no problem at all. Could the bird have an infectious disease that could potentially infect your cat? Um, yeah, of course they can, right? We just talked about worms. Cats hunt and sometimes they get worms from hunting. Uh, are there other infectious diseases? Yeah. Um, but usually it, you'll notice that if your cat starts acting sick, then it's an issue. Generally speaking, they can digest a bird. That's what they're designed to do. They are obligate carnivores after all. So um, if your cat is an avid hunter, this is for all of you. If your cat's an avid hunter and hunts on a regular basis, if you were my client, I would say not a big deal. I mean, we don't want to decimate the local songbird population or, you know, endanger like it's endangered rodents or something, right? So <laughs> that could be a problem, right? But health for the cat wise, I would say just have your cat dewormed every six months. If you want to take it to another level and you're really kind of worried about it and worms kind of freak you out, um, take a poop sample to your uh, veterinarian every six months, every three months, whatever makes you feel best. Have them check it, make sure there isn't anything you're missing, and then have them dewormed every six months. Because chances are, if your cat is an avid hunter, they're probably carrying some level of worms. Sorry to say it, just true. Nature, hello. Um, but it's not a big deal. You can get rid of them really easy. So that's my only thoughts on that. The only other thought is... For hunters, I have seen cats come in with 
poisoning from eating a rat or a mouse or some other, you know, small furry creature that had been poisoned. Um, and rat poisoning can affect the neurological system. It can affect the, the blood system clotting. So in those cases, yes, that's an issue. But those animals, cats that get poisoned by this kind of event, they act sick, right? So if your cat is eating animals and acts sick in any other way, have them checked out by a vet. If you know the animal has been poisoned, then get them checked out by a vet right away. How do you know? Well, sometimes you are lucky and actually see the poison. Uh, and poison is usually a, a colored granule is usually what it looks like. It's often green or blue, depending on where you live. Sometimes I've seen it be pink. Um, but sometimes if you see the rat, like if your animal comes, if your cat comes and brings you the pet, the Sarah, what are you trying to say here? <laughs> if the cat brings their prey and gives it to you as a present and you see any of those colored granules, like in the stomach contents, get the to a veterinarian because that's a problem. Okay, so that's all I have to say on that. Jillian Mailer, hi, thank you so much for your question. What can cause back foot sores in a cat without any other symptoms? Back foot sores, well, lots of things can cause back foot sores, infectious diseases, uh, such as bacterial or fungal or mites, those can all cause sores. Food allergies can cause sores. Um, I would say if the cat is not walking or is like cage bound or can't use the back legs, if they drag their feet, they can cause sores. There can be tumors that can look like a sore. There can be infections um, that cause local ulcers. Um, abscesses can cause that. Over grooming. So cats that um, are very stressed, they can actually groom the hair off of themselves and cause sores. So it could be behavioral, could be medical. If you were asking me and I was here only saying this for educational purposes, I would say, hmm, that's interesting. Probably need to get it seen. Could be something super simple to solve. But if it was me, I wouldn't like to have back sores uh, and I would like to have it handled. So um, yeah, so hopefully that gives you some ideas of things that it could be. Again, without seeing the sores or understanding more about your story, I can only give you this much educational material, not advice. Kathy BB says, hello. Well, I just have to put that up there because it's adorable. Hello, Kathy BB. Thank you so much for putting that out there. It's super sweet. Okay. Oh, Drew, Drew, you back with more questions. Okay. And also, should my cat, who's three year old, orange tiger domestic medium hair, beautiful, be taking vitamins or supplements? Or is that only for unhealthy cats? I would say if your three year old cat is otherwise healthy and eating a good diet that is complete and balanced, um, and you aren't home cooking for that cat, that they should be able to get all of the supplements that they need at that point. Now as cat, and so I, I don't necessarily think you have to. Now, if you want to, then the things I would recommend for a three-year-old cat would be, uh, I love omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil. I love omega-3 fatty acids. Can I say, I love them. <laughs> And I know that cats are predisposed, a lot of them, to developing kidney problems and dental problems. And fish oil, especially the liquid fish oil that you could actually like, you know, put it on their teeth and stuff. Um, it benefits kidney health and it benefits dental health and it benefits liver health and brain health and skin health and heart health. I love omega-3 fatty acids. As far as a multivitamin, would it be bad to give a three-year-old cat that? No. Not at all. And let me tell you why. Because anything the cat doesn't need, they will just urinate or defecate it out, right? 
you're not going to throw a cat into an imbalance by giving a multivitamin. Um, now you will throw them into balance if you don't balance their diet and you don't want to give very young kittens or kittens that are growing anything I would say under nine months of age, no, no vitamins, just no. Also, you want to be careful with things like calcium and phosphorus and things like that um, because cats can have sensitivity around those, especially if they have any kind of impaired kidney function. So can you give a three-year-old cat a multivitamin? Yes. Might it be a waste of your money because they're just urinating, defecating most of it out because they're already getting what they need? Maybe. Right? I haven't done a study on it, so I don't know. What about an older cat? Six, seven, eight. As long as they're otherwise healthy and don't have any kind of medical issues that would preclude them taking a multivitamin, I actually think that is a good idea. And let me tell you why. Because as the cats age, their ability to digest and absorb everything from every single little kibble goes down. And so you kind of, you know, give them a couple more pieces of the nutritional puzzle by giving them a high quality multivitamin if they will eat it. And fish oil. <laughs> Love fish oil. Only other, the only other um, caveat I would give for that is three-year-old cat, you could give them probiotics. A lot of foods actually have probiotics incorporated in them already. So that would be the other one. Here's a question from Jonathan Wheeler. Hello, my friend. How much food should I feed in my six month old kitten? This is my first one. Well, congratulations and welcome to the journey. I am so glad that you're here and you're gonna have a long, lovely relationship with this little fur friend. So a six month old cat, cats finish growing anywhere between six to nine months, depending on the cat, right? So six month old cat, they often, I would say, I would say, first of all, you need to know how much that cat weighs. And then once you know how much that cat weighs, look on your bag of food and there will be a feeding chart on the back. And then look at the what is recommended for your size of cat and then feed like 10% less than that, 10% less. And let me tell you why. And I've said the same thing for years um, and I'm, I still stand by it. Food manufacturers want to sell food. So they're always generous with what they're saying to feed. And as a veterinarian, one of my main battles when I was in practice was obesity. So many of the cats were indoors, living the, living the life, safe from infectious disease, safe from trauma. And then they had problems associated with obesity and stress because they're outdoor hunters, not indoor couch potatoes. So I always say feed like 10% less, even better, ask your veterinarian because veterinarians, here's a secret guys, veterinarians love it when clients ask them specifically how much to feed their cat. It's true um, because we have lots to say about that. So your veterinarian will be able to, if you know the brand and type of food, they will be able to look at that label, see how many kilocalories per cup it is and calculate exactly how much you should be feeding. Okay, so that's the second way to do it is ask your vet. If you wanna get bonus points, ask them to tell you how much to feed in weight, grams. Yes, this is super nerdy and it you, this will help you. If you follow what I'm saying, this will help you. Um, because and I actually learned this from my friend, Ernie Ward, Dr. Ernie Ward, who is the founder of the, uh, the Association for Prevention of Pet Obesity. It's some long name, but he's very, very passionate about this. And he told me that when you measure out in a cup, there can even just one extra kibble, one or two or three extra kibbles can amount to too many calories over a time, long period of time. And then that can lead to really slow weight gain over time. And then fat cats are higher risk for everything, basically. Um, diabetes, type two diabetes, arthritis, high blood pressure, kidney problems, grooming, pro oh, it just goes on and on. So, but if you ask your veterinarian how much to feed in grams and then get a gram scale and weigh the food out, 
then you are more tightly controlling that. And if you think about it, cats are really small animals, right? And so even just a little bit extra every single day adds up really quick on a small frame. It's probably more than you wanted me to say, but here I go. So that's the second way. Third way, um, I don't know for a six month old kitten, but I do know for most adult cats, this is kind of your average, you know, eight to 10 pound cat, right? Those size cats should not be eating any more than 330 kilocalories per day, period. And that includes treats, canned food, people food, right? That, so you have to think about everything that goes into that cat per day. And I am telling you, if you can keep this cat at a healthy weight, you will reduce your, your cost of veterinary care as the cat ages. Cat will live longer. Cat will be happier. Cat will be pain, less painful from arthritis. So many benefits, right? So how do you know if your cat's at a healthy weight? Two ways, three ways. Okay, there's many ways. I'll talk about three ways. Ask your vet or ask the veterinary technician. Uh, the technician often knows even better how to do this than they, they, they know a lot, right? And sometimes you can't get all the way to the vet, veterinarian, but you can often get your foot in the door and have a phone call with a veterinary technician, right? And they also love when you ask them about like how to help your cat stay at a healthy weight. Oh, you're going to be their favorite client. Second uh, way is... I call it the hand test. If you guys have been on here with me before, then you've seen this already, but it's simple. So if you take your hand like this, and then you feel your cat's ribs. I was looking to see if I have a stuffed animal in here, but I don't. Okay, so if a cat, if you're looking at a cat from a side, head over here, tail over here, body, right? Front legs here, right behind the front legs, there's ribs. If you take your finger and you go like this, don't get bit, don't piss your cat off. But if you go like this, you can feel their ribs. If their ribs feel like the back of your hand, like this. Perfect, you good. If they feel like this, too fat. If they stick out like the knuckles, too skinny. I see a lot of uh, ancient cats with um, kidney disease and hyperthyroidism that have ribs that look like that. Okay. So that's the second way. Third way, look on the line, look up body condition score chart for cats. You will see a chart that has a series of cats on a side view and a top view. Uh, and then the cats will have um, different body conditions from very, very skinny down to very fat. And you can look on that and see where your cat's at. There are two body condition scores that veterinarians use. One is a score out of nine zero to nine, one is a score out of five. They both work. Um, a body condition score of five out of nine, perfect. Body condition score of two and a half out of five, perfect, okay? Probably more than you want on that, but there you go. Okay. Rising 101, I will do my best on this, but again, remember, veterinarian, not behaviorist. How do I get two cats to like each other? They've had a few bad interactions. Great question. Uh, short answer. You provide a very supportive environment for them where they have all of their own resources and plenty of space, and then you let them deal with it as they will. They may um, become friends. They may barely tolerate each other. They may avoid each other like the plague for the rest of their life. You can't control. You can't control, but you do need to make sure they each have their own set of resources and a lot of, like enough space where they can get away from each other. Okay. Mm. So when I say resources, I mean things like food and water bowl, litter box. You could, should always have one more box and number of cats. So if you have two cats, you need three boxes. Food and water bowl, bedding, toys, climbing spaces, resting spaces, all their own, okay? Cats tend to form very tight social groups. And the weird thing about cats is their social group can just be one. It can just be them. <laughs> cats can also be introverts or extroverts, just like humans. And some cats just don't ever want to have anything to do with other cats. 
Um, other cats can have a few bad interactions, but if you give them plenty of space and reduce the stress in the rest of their life and don't force it, they can eventually come to some sort of truce. But there may still always be some sort of signaling between those cats, hey, don't come into my space, okay? Um, you can spread out some catnip um, and let them have some catnip and see if that would help them. Again, make sure they have space. A cat will always choose to run away and not fight. But if a cat feels cornered, they will fight. And then there will be bite wounds or scratch wounds. And that usually means a trip to come see me to deal with an abscess. So you wanna make sure that the cats never feel cornered, right? You can also um, utilize pheromones. Pheromones work for a lot of people, but they don't work for everybody. The most famous one I know, product I know about is Feel Away. They pretty much patented a feline pheromone spray that reduces stress, right? So you wanna make sure to be reducing their stress in the rest of their environment, make sure they have enough resources, make sure they have space to get away from each other, provide some calming aids, and don't force it. Don't ever force it, ever. That's what I got to say about that, okay? Also, if one of the cats um, is experiencing any kind of medical painful condition, um, that can cause them to become extra grumpy. So make sure both of the cats are healthy, right? Doctor, this is what I do. <laughs> okay. Richard Rothenberg, can a four month old kitten still become a lab cat? Of course they can. Of course they can. Any age cat can become a lap cat. The thing about cats is, like I already said, you cannot force it. You can make it a super positive experience. Like maybe if you start out with the cat just maybe holding some treats on your lap or maybe holding their food bowl in your lap um, and then just sit there still while they eat, right? Um, don't even touch them. Make it so that it's positive and safe and calming, right? Um, and then go really, really slow. Maybe you have to start out with offering the treat further away if you have a skittish cat or a scared cat, or maybe you have to set it down and have it just be around you for a while. The, the trick with that is to go slow, but yes, you can, definitely. Oh no, Les Wagenheim, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, my Sphinx cats have an odor. My girlfriend doesn't want to come over anymore because the house smells like cats. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I should not be laughing. It's not funny. This is not funny. I got to pull it together, Sarah. Okay. Yes. So cats have an odor. So, um, well, if, if I could help you with cat odor, here's a couple of things. Um, make sure that they're spayed or excuse me, neutered. If you have a male cat that's not neutered, oof, they have a musk, it just stinks. <laughs> so you have to have them neutered. Um, make sure they don't have any kind of uh, overgrowth of bacteria or, bacteria or fungus on their skin. We, we know Sphinx have special skin and hardly any, no hair. And so sometimes there can be an imbalance in the, the microflora on the surface of the cat. Um, cat, I would say cat hair also has an odor, but you don't have any cat hair. If they have any problems with urination in places that they shouldn't, um, make sure to get those cleaned really, really well. But do make sure that the odor isn't coming from some sort of, um, imbalance on the, the, um, the bacteria that's on the surface of the cat, because there's gotta be something that's smelling, and usually it's not just uh, the oil that comes out of the pores. It's usually some imbalance in the critters that are living on the cat, okay? So those are a couple of suggestions. <laughs> Alternatively, you could just get a new girlfriend. I don't know, could be a thing. Cats, girlfriend. <laughs> okay, I'm very much into jokes today. I apologize, guys. Okay. Hmm. Huh. You'll do. 
You will do. Hello, doctor. Hi. I love in Canada. Yes, you do. You love in Canada. Um, you live in Canada, Montreal. I have a Rex Cornish and I realize that when she sleeps, she is shaking. It is normal. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Could be that she's cold. I mean, you do live in Canada. So it could be that. <clears throat> could be neurological. Not sure. I think the best thing to do, you know what I'm going to say here already, take a video of it. Take a good video that's well lit and get that check, cat checked out by a veterinarian. Make sure there's not an underlying medical condition. Um, al alternatively, you could see if um, getting a heated bed might help if the cat's cold. But if it's a medical condition, you really got to talk to a vet. Okay, here is a question. Cat Gail. Hello, my friend. My cat hasn't eaten in two days, but seems otherwise completely fine. When should I be worried? She's incredibly food motivated, usually. Great question. I, uh, I actually feel like I can really help somebody today, and I'm really glad that you asked it. So um, cats, I would say in two days, your cat is probably still safe. But if your cat goes any longer without eating, you really need to go to a vet, like tomorrow. Like if your cat's not eating tomorrow, you need to go to a vet. And the reason for that is cats that do not eat after a period of time, this is for everybody in case you don't know this, this might save your cat's life at some point. If a cat does not eat for a extended period of time, and I've seen it happen in, as in short of five days, I've seen it happen in five days, usually it takes more like a week, but I've seen it happen in five. I, I feel like I've seen it happen sooner, but I don't remember. If a cat does not eat for an extended period of time, not two days, usually longer, they can develop a condition called hepatic lipidosis. You may have heard of it called fatty liver syndrome. And it's just a terrible design. I don't know why cats are designed this way, but what happens is if they don't eat, then they mobilize their fat. The fat overwhelms the liver cells. Liver cells become very sick and the cat can die from secondary liver disease. Ah, terrible. So you always, 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 always want to make sure to pay attention if your cat isn't eating. And if it's been like more than two days, call a vet, get your cat seen, get your cat tested, get your cat treated. If your cat is incredibly food motivated normally and is not eating, that's also definitely um, a red flag um, because cats need to have you pay attention in a certain way. The other thing is you can try, if your cat's not food motivated, but you really want to try and get your cat to eat today, go to the grocery store, get yourself a rotisserie chicken, if they're still doing those out there, bring it home, um, strip off the fat, get some white meat, shred it, and put a little bit down for your cat. You should eat it too, <laughs> but put a little bit down for your cat. Alternatively, you can get some canned food and warm it in the microwave for maybe 10, 15 seconds. So it's just warm and it's stinkier. Um, see if that will work um, to kind of stimulate your cat's appetite. If you're really worried right now, call your vet, right? Uh, at least calling them today, even if you don't get seen today, um, if your cat's still not eating tomorrow, then you will have secured yourself an appointment and you have somebody to talk to who can support you through this and you're not sitting there going, oh my God, should I go, should I go, should I go, right? Even if your cat starts eating, then just call and cancel the appointment, right? You're not obligated to go if your cat feels better. All right, thank you for asking that question. I feel like that's an important one. Okay, Jessica. Any wet food recommendations for kidney disease instead of Royal Canin or Hills or Purina? My cat is super picky. Thank you for asking that question, Jessica. First of all, I, um, I know that Blue Buffalo does make a kidney diet as well. So you may want to try them. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. Um, with the ones from Hills and Purina and um, what, what are they calling it now? Royal Canin. I used to call it Waltham. That's how old I am. But they, just so you know, they do have several different kinds of kidney diets. Each of them, they have like stews and flavors and pates and all kinds of different 
all kinds of different types that you can try. And oftentimes if you tell your veterinary hospital, hey, I'm having a hard time getting my cat to eat, can you please give me a whole smorgasbord of different diets to try? I need lots of different ones. They should give you like one can of each. And oftentimes they'll even do it for free because they get samples from their, their company, right? From those companies. So see if they have like a little sampler pack that they can give you. Other things to try, obviously try warming the food like I just talked about. Um, maybe if you can't, so here, and here is the end of the, end of the day, end of the day. The cat needs to eat something. Even if they're not eating what they should eat, the cat needs to eat something while you're trying to transition this cat. Could be that your cat just doesn't feel very well or has nausea from the kidney disease, and maybe they need some nausea medication, or maybe they need some subcutaneous fluids to rehydrate so they feel good enough to want to eat. Or maybe your cat needs an appetite stimulant. Yes, that is a thing. You can actually give them an appetite stimulant that you get from your vet, right? So there are options out there. The only other prescription diet that I know of that I think is sold as a kidney diet is blue buffalo, I think. Yeah. But all the rest of those guys have tons of different flavors. The other thing is make sure your cat actually needs to go on a kidney diet. Now, this is a bit controversial. Not all vets believe the same way. But I believe that it's very important to have the kidney disease level staged. It's called ISIS staged. Um, excuse me, <laughs> ISIS. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta get that, I gotta pull it up here. I'm not ISIS, iris staging. Yeah, okay, it's called iris staging in cats. <laughs> I don't look it up, it's been a minute. So um, basically there's several different levels of kidney disease, right? Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And then I think there's different levels within each of those. And only as they get to the more advanced levels of kidney disease, do they need to go on the prescription diet. If your cat is in early stages, early, early stages, you may be able to get away with just feeding a high quality senior diet, right? Could happen. So it really depends on what I iris stage your cat is at. And then everything else I threw in. See, lots of options. So again, probably gave you more information than you want, but now you have something to go back and ask your vet about. Um, okay. I been watched the cat food videos. Hello, Teresa. Hello, my friend. I tried to change my cat to wet food. No weight loss. I had a cat die from diabetes. Oh, I am very sorry, hon. How can I help Fennel lose weight? She is four years old and weighs 13 pounds. So again, weight loss is a journey. We are, are, we're all focused on that number as the destination, but it's all about the journey. And in order to have navigate this journey successfully, especially if you're not experiencing any weight loss right now, you need a guide. <laughs> you need a guide on your journey. And who is your best guide? That's right. That's right, it's your veterinarian. And you need a somebody that you can work with because they are going to be able to get you on to a food that hopefully will help you more. Um, because the other thing is when you restrict calories of a normal maintenance diet for a cat and feed them less than they're supposed to be fed per the bag, you can contribute to malnutrition because it's not just the calories that's in the food. There's amino acids, there's vitamins, there's minerals, there's lots of stuff in there, there's fiber, right? And so if they're, they're getting less of all of that, but their body still needs all those vitamins and minerals, right? So oftentimes just restricting the amount of commercial food that you're feeding doesn't work very well. Or switching to canned food can help some people because there's a higher wa water content, but still getting a therapeutic diet that's specifically designed for weight loss will really help you. One of my favorites when I was in practice there's lots of good ones out there, but I really liked the Hills Metabolic Diet. It just 
seem to melt pounds off of dogs and cats like crazy. Um, and then, like I said earlier, get a gram scale. Make sure that you are feeding the appropriate amount. Because remember, just a couple of extra kibbles a day can sabotage your weight loss efforts. Three, make sure that that cat is moving every single day, not only moving to play, but moving to get their food. Um, I, I like to take a piece of kibble, whatever is measured out for the day, and toss it kibble by kibble by kibble so that the cat has to run back and forth to get it. Because otherwise, sometimes it's almost impossible. You can split the food up and elevate it if your cat doesn't have any mobility problems and make them jump and walk around the house to get their food. There's lots of different ways to get these cats moving. Train them for a leash, walk, le leash walk them. So that's the thing, make sure you are feeding, I would, I would feed a therapeutic food, like metabolic or whatever one your vet likes. I would make sure you're feeding the appropriate amount. I'd make sure that that cat is spending more calories than they're taking in. So that means exercise. Lastly, if you're still not getting anywhere, make sure nobody in that household is sabotaging your weight loss efforts. I cannot tell you how many times I saw clients and they were like, I just cannot get this animal to losing weight. I just can't. I've done everything. I've fed them the food you wanted. I fed them the exact same amount. And we're still here at the same place. And the, the scale is not budged. And this is your problem, doctor. And I was like, whoa, hold on. We might have some user error or some silent saboteurs. And what I often found was when there's multiple people in the house and they're not communicating with each other clearly about who's feeding the cat when, sometimes the cat was getting double fed. Sometimes the cat was getting treats. Sometimes grandma was slipping gravy and turkey to the cat when mom wasn't looking. Sometimes the cat was eating the food off of the ground that the kids drop. This is what cats do. They are, they're just as bad as dogs in this way. So make sure you don't have any saboteurs in your house that are accidentally slipping some extra calories to your cat, okay? And then come back next month, Teresa Lenum, sorry, my eyes, and you tell me, if you're having any success. The other thing is make sure you know the goal weight. So uh, I don't know what your goal weight is for your cat, but give yourself six months to reach that goal weight and have your cat weighed by your veterinarian or you can weigh your cat at home once a month. And the way to weigh your cat at home is to get a scale, weigh yourself, pick up your cat, weigh yourself with your cat, subtract the amount that you weigh, that gives you your cat's weight, okay? You should be making steady progress every single month. If you do all that and you're still having a problem, get that, get that cat examined and have blood work run to make sure you're not dealing with any kind of hormonal issues, okay? I believe in you. You can do this. Okay. Oh, okay. Ken, hi. My cat is like 15 years old and is sleeping a lot more lately, but when she, when awake, seems perfectly fine. Should I prepare for the end? No, not necessarily. Nope, nope. That's okay. That is okay. So if your cat seems totally normal when awake, awesome. If they are sleeping more, um, it could be arthritis. So arthritis in cats is grossly underdiagnosed. There was a study put out a couple of years ago and they just surveyed a whole huge number of cats and they found that a large percentage, I don't remember off the top of my head, but enough for me to go, what? A large number of cats by the age of three had some sort of x-ray evidence of arthritis on their skeleton. And most cats over age seven have some level of pain from arthritis. And one of the signs of arthritis pain in cats is, believe it or not, sleeping more. So if your cat is sleeping more, there's definitely something going on, but is it something that's gonna necessarily lead to death? I don't think so, but I don't know, right? Educational only. What I'd recommend is have the cat examined. Have, and, and say, sleeping more, and Dr. Wooten said, <laughs> don't say that, don't say that. Um, 
Just say, I'm concerned about the arthritis. Can you check my cat for arthritis? And then also have them run blood and urine. Okay, that will give you an idea if there are any things that could be causing you your cat to um, be sick, right? So that's my recommendation, okay? Good luck, my friend. Okay, we have a little bit of time. Oh, great question, okay. Harden nine, the clinic recommended putting my cat on urinary medical diet because she had urinary blockage twice in a month. First time bacterial, second time crystals. Does she need to stay on that diet for life? Not necessarily, not necessarily. So crystals in, uh, urinary crystals in cats, I have not much time, but I will try and give you guys the Reader's Digest because it can be very confusing for cat owners. Urinary crystals, there's several different types of crystals. The most common ones that we see in cats are calcium oxalate and struvite. Struvite, calcium oxalate. Struvite crystals are often associated with a urinary tract infection. Last time I checked, we didn't know whether the crystals cause the infection or the infection cause the crystals yet. It's kind of the chicken before the egg or the cart before the horse thing. We're, we're still kind of working that out. But what we did notice is that there was a high incidence of struvite crystals, S-T-R-U-V-I-T-E, in cats that had urinary tract infections. So it's not surprising since your cat had a urinary tract infection that they would develop some crystals afterwards. Calcium oxalate crystals on the other hand are usually more due to something in the cat's makeup that causes the pH of their urine to precipitate out calcium oxalate crystals. Calcium oxalate crystals are less often um, associated with a urinary tract infection. Okay, so struvite, infection, calcium oxalate, something weird with the cat and the way they metabolize things in their kidneys, okay? Calcium, cats with calcium oxalate crystals often need to be on a urinary formula food for the rest of their life. And the reason being is because that food changes the pH of their urine and causes them to drink more water. So they're less likely to form crystals in solution. Does that make sense? Because crystals require certain pHs to form. Cats that have struvite crystals, especially something that's associated with an infection, oftentimes do not need to be on that diet for life because when they're not infected, they're perfectly normal. So my recommendation to you, my friend, is Feed the food for two months. Actually, this is not advice. This is for educational purposes only. Okay. Uh, if it was my cat, I would feed the urinary food for two months. I'm not even sure what they prescribed. I'm not even going to try. And then I would take the cat back to my doctor and have them get urine via cystocentesis. Cystocentesis. So when they take a needle and they put it right into the bladder and they suck the urine right out of the bladder. So it's a sterile collection. It's very important that it's a sterile collection because urine, once it go, exits the body, becomes contaminated with bacteria in the environment. So we need to make sure that that cat actually eradicated the infection and that they run the urinalysis on fresh urine. Because here's the other kicker. You ready? I'm telling you guys all the secrets. The longer urine sits out at room temperature or even sometimes in the fridge, the higher likelihood it is to form crystals. Even if the urine when it was in the cat's totally normal, if it sits out on the counter for an hour, it'll probably have crystals in it. It's just chemistry guys, right? It's chemistry. So you wanna make sure that the urine is collected via cystocentesis straight from the bladder. And then if you're really serious about this, you want a urinalysis run immediately, including a urine sediment. Um, sediment is where they spin the urine down and they check for crystals, right? And then if you wanna be really complete, I would have the urine sent off for culture and um, urine culture and sensitivity. And what that does is they put the urine in a whole bunch of different wells and they look and see if any particular bacterial strains grow 
And then if they grow, then they test those bacterial strains against all these different kinds of antibiotics to see what antibiotics those bacteria are sensitive to. Best case scenario, you take your cat in, they get urine, the urinalysis is completely clear. There are no crystals, there, are, there is no infection. Transition your cat back to the normal diet. If it was my cat, if it was my cat, okay? Worst case scenario, there's crystals, there's still an infection. Oh my God, what's going on? Take it to the next level at that point, okay? Hopefully that helps. Okay, my friends, I am all out of words. It's been an hour. <laughs> I feel like I need to go drink some tea. But I truly appreciate this opportunity to share information with you that could potentially save your cat's life or help your cat live longer or help you save on vet bills or help you just be happier. And I truly, truly appreciate everybody who tuned in for a whole hour to listen to this lady in a white coat just sit here and blather on. I hope the information I have shared has been helpful and I will be back again next month, last Tuesday of the month at 2 p.m to deliver a yet another uh, nail biter of a session. <laughs> if you have more questions, please head on over. I do this through All About Cats, which is a phenomenal community of cat lovers all over the world. And there are forums where you can ask questions and there's actually experts hanging out in those forums. So if you go there and you type out your questions, even put down pictures, they might be able to help you, okay? If you've liked this and you want me to do more, leave me a comment. Tell me topics you'd like me to cover. Tell me, um, I don't know, where you're from, what your cat name is, what the breed is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's about all I have to say on that. So thank you so much, you guys. I will see you next month and be very well.